Uh, hello, this is the April 11th Beehive Production user call. We have Andrew, Hans, Patrick, Jan, and myself, Michael. Hopefully others will roll in. Uh, segueing from yesterday's open ZFS discussion, I came across dupe remove. And uh, you are welcome to look at these links there. It, it, I forget who put this across my desk, but they're like, um, okay, here's a tool that claims to do perhaps an offline dedupe. I will leave it to the reader to explore that further. Also from the does what department, boxybsd.com uh, showed um, up last week. Yes, Jan. The old uh, fdupes command, if it's not another command by the same name, just helps you to uh, create hard or some links uh, so that if you have your, let's say you have your uh, media collection from several generations of desktops or something, you want to... Yep unify that, then you don't have to uh, clean up your file structure because it will just hard or swim link the, um, the files together, but that doesn't help you for um, virtual machine images because it's very unlikely that you are accidentally going to end up with two bit by bit identical uh, images and are able to promise that none of them are modified. Yeah. If you can promise that, then you are in a position to ma do the link management or clone management or whatever yourself. Do you know um, what the criteria is, like date stamp or hash or mm -hmm. what? You can, depends on the tools, there are several of these tools uh, in ports. Uh, it can be uh, that it, keeps a cryptographic hash in a database, I think. It can be that it recompares each time uh, or that it trusts the, and uh, some of them have incremental modes where you can control if they, they trust basically the cached uh, M3 time, inode number I and think. device ID. It's a bit messy because device IDs can change between reboots. So you have to basically re rediscover the mapping from mount point to device ID. And yeah, so DFT in start. It's, um, yeah, it's possible. It's not, I don't see any use for it as on a VM hosting platform or something. And um, you need something better just doing it offline on a per file level isn't going to help you with anything useful. You can do it. It won't really hurt unless you use dangerous combinations like hard linking uh, copied images or some things which you expect to uh, diverge in the future. Yeah, that uh, but well. yeah, that's uh, going to be um, funny, as they say. Yes. Okay, well, cool. Someone they did the funny. They, they hard linked the virtual machines and started both of them. <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> so this had some notion of ZFS, but they were like, yeah, no, it um, doesn't sound like that's very helpful. Yeah, if you do copy file range, then such a tool becomes useful. <laughs> but that I am not familiar of any with any of these tools being able to take advantage of copy file range so that you get two files with copy on write semantics for their content. Mm -hmm. um, the downside of doing that is that you would have to do it truly offline to rule out anyone else uh, writing to the file at the same time because right. you have a time of check versus time of uh, write, basically a um, race condition here with a copy file range because you have to, in the user space, compare the content and then tell the kernel, yeah, user space decided this is the same. Now please dedupe it. And if anyone else modifies it in between, yeah. uh, you've overwritten the data with a deduplication of the old content. Um, if I remember correctly, Linux has some IOCTL-based way to express that intent, but it's not supported by... Uh, um, OpenZFS, it's, I think, only supported by uh, BetterFS, and yeah, that's about it. FreeBSD uh, doesn't have such a system call at all, 
and I don't think it should be uh, hacked into an iOctal. Um, and with the lowers, I can't tell. Cool. Um, there it is. There it was. Have a nice day. I'll leave it to the reader. Thank you for the, those insights, Jan. Uh, this showed up boxybsd.com from uh, Jip Tazi, who has been on a few calls. Do, 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 do. We believe in our project is FAQ. Uh, has anyone heard of this? First things first. Can I get a VM? A choice of VMs. Okay, FreeBSD 14, OpenBSD 7.4. Hey, 5 is out. 7.5 is out. NetBSD 10, they're in Germany. Oh, we're on, on theme here. This is good. Um, <laughs> I noticed that. <laughs> Donate, donate. Okay. Well, there it is. It showed up. Maybe it is useful to one of you and our listeners. Okay. Moving on. And Jan, you might have some thoughts here. I reached out to KP at Christoph Provost and uh, Tom Jones and just was like, okay, so how can we visualize the bottlenecks possibly created by tap devices not being uh, multi queue and first things first, we tried to translate flame graph into German, giving us flammen graph or flammen diagram or diagram. Uh, but then moving it on. It would still be a graph. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then I couldn't help but notice that our good friend Olivier, I don't know if I close the tab, but I'll hop, happily jump in there. Uh, in one of his lovely papers, um, there was the PMC handling. So uh, I, uh, one thing that came up is that the bridge has very few D trace hooks because it's a pretty old piece of software. Another suggestion is that maybe it's not even P a D trace you're after, but maybe PMC tools. And then I found this and I thought, oh, okay. So someone's thinking, uh, I would love to visualize so, that. Any suggestions, Jan? Um, unless there's lots of inlining, you may be covered by just using function boundary uh, tracing in D-Trace. The downside of that is that function boundary tracing doesn't work with inlining. While it changes the timing slightly, you may be able to just compile the bridge driver as a module and then change the make file to make sure that it doesn't inline uh, the functions you care about. So basically you would have no inline, whatever flex, to uh, Clang, and then you should get all the call, calls as true calls and not inline calls. Uh, well, again, that makes it a little bit slower, but doesn't change the design problem. So it's probably what you could do. And the nice thing is that the bridge driver isn't really required to boot. So unlike a storage driver, you can change it, reload it at runtime and so on. So uh, did you say recompile the tap module in some way or what? No, not the tap. The uh, tap uh, would also work. Yeah, Say, same logic. Basically, take the load the uh, driver you want to analyze where you suspect the um, the bottleneck is. On the host uh, Where you want to see the bottleneck. Uh, you could uh, make sure that you see all the function calls, at least. If you have giant functions and need timing information, and event uh, from inside a function, okay, then you truly have to use uh, static dtrace probes for that, or the new uh, kernel instruction uh, dtrace module where you can put a breakpoint on a specific instruction offsets inside a function, but that uh, basically requires looking at the disassembly to figure out where it goes. And what it means and what's the register map at that point. But yeah, um, at that point, the hardware performance counters are probably a lot easier to use uh, because you don't care about crashes or stopping the system to prevent it from uh, crashing so that you get into a state where you can debug the state you ended up in. You only care about how fast is this and that's what, yeah. Okay. The PMC I, stuff gives you. 
that driver would be analyzed on the host or the VM? Uh, depends on which side of the question you're looking at. Okay, uh, the bottleneck in Beehive, uh, as far as I guess, and that's only a guess, uh, is that it's on the host, uh, and you can use for another operating system than FreeBSD as a guest to verify that it's not guest uh, operating dr system driver specific, mm -hmm. but. I can tell you from having looked at the code without taking any benchmark numbers that the, the driver needs at least one uh, read or write system call to move a package for each package. Um, and that's a VM exit. So yeah, it's slow because the it takes a lot of context switches. Even the NetMap one doesn't give us the vast improvements we would hope for because it's held back not by what NetMap can do for you, but what uh, Beehive's API does, and that the packets are really moved uh, by having basically the Beehive process in a user space thread do a mem copy from one memory mapped wing buffer to another. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, and it at least goes through the Beehive uh, dispatch logic uh, once per packet. Not 100% sure if there are any context switches involved or if it's just basically having an outer loop copying one cop packet per mem copy uh, vocation and then copying the next and the next, instead of figuring out of it could do uh, a big mem copy, but mem copy calls are so cheap. So that when we have that problem, we are in a very good place. Hmm. Uh, if you had only 10 minutes to set something up, do you have a shortest path for visualizing that stress? No. Okay. I've only looked at aggregate bandwidth numbers uh, to figure out which ones to look into, what works, how much advantage is there in messing with NetMap? Is it worth trying? Do you think so counting the VM exits from Beehive CTL might be helpful or inefficient? From Beehive CTL? A whole bunch of, yeah, it'll oh, leave that as counting. Yeah, you can leave that running uh, or you could put whatever you want it debugger to read it out eventually. Um, anyway. Can you get rid of out efficiently because you have to make sure that you're not uh, disturbing the system too much by just measuring too exactly. aggressive. Exactly, exactly. Um, for example, if there's a mutex around the counters because there are multiple counters and they're protected by a single mutex and suddenly the lock becomes contested because it is still just a single counter and not the in-kernel atomic counter stuff, yeah, then maybe you have problems here uh, if you pull too aggressively. Sure, 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 sure. sure. I okay. think the important part is where is to look at the flame graph and find out basically the heat map of, of where in the kernel you're spending all your time and then because it's not that the mem copy implementation is bad and it does it, I don't know, in eight bit chunks, one bit at a time and shifting them around. And the problem is that we are doing too many, too small operations. So you have to uh, change the design a little so that you can get the performance improvement. We should look at what uh, at least some Solaris folks did by uh, using the Yona, I think they call it. Right. And yeah. how that interfaces with their uh, VMM backend. Because it's from a quick look at it a few months ago, it looked like this is similar enough to uh, the uh, NetMap uh, veil ports that it's, yeah, it should work almost the same. But the other question is if they have uh, exported as a smarter VitIO driver, because the next problem then is that the VitIO net 
driver as implemented, sorry, not the driver, the, the power virtualized device provided by Beehive in FreeBSD at least 14 uses only a subset of what the vidio net uh, specification allows, which is fine. It gets you rocking, but it means that, for example, it supports only a single queue uh, and doesn't support uh, any of the offloading features. So claiming to support uh, LRO, TSO, uh, maybe even GSO, generic socket, uh, segment offloading, mm. and then basically moving big yeah. batches right. between uh, guest and host and having the host do software um, emulation and rewriting of the packets will probably also help a lot. Um, Oh. A quick uh, cheat uh, to try to guesstimate how much you can gain there would be to use, uh, at least on FreeBSD, a static link aggregate among, let's say, four or eight uh, with our net devices to emulate a, basically a crazy idea of a virtualized uh, multi queue device and then using enough connections for your throughput benchmarks that you get good load distribution. Ah, did did I just hear you use multiple burnt IO interfaces to kind of see Yeah, how it, but just as a nasty workaround. Yeah, um, I agree, yeah, but I like you, it. You shouldn't have to configure a four or eight uh, port link aggregate uh, interface just to set a 10 gig or so virtual networking. Mm -hmm. And you would still be moving the packets individually, but I think with one uh, thread per vidio interface inside of Beehive, so uh, you would even get SMP performance improvements. But yeah, interesting. Okay, well, and I recall someone doing that over the years, but it's been years. Cool. Anything else on that topic? I just wanted to visualize something yeah. that some people absolutely must see it to understand the problems occasionally including myself did you hear back about uh i o m m u uh, improvements for bigger a m d systems uh i have not um uh i understand kib is just working in silence uh, perhaps actively i have not watched the tree this week i will say that if someone wants to take a quick peek at what might have uh changed but i don't have news same with uh, amd bits uh, arm bits arm 64 bits so if someone has a moment, feel free to rummage to see Git and watch for changes. Uh, this came up last week, and I couldn't, in a quick search, find the exact mention, but someone found that the, the B, uh, PCI pass-through with a Linux guest and a network device was acting quite differently depending on how they loaded the uh, virtual machine. And they found that going from... Uh, going from UEFI to Grub solve their problem. And I am quite grateful for the notion of focusing on PCI pass-through with the variable being the loader when possible. Obviously, there are limitations there. But anyway, uh, if anyone recalls that conversation, great. Otherwise, I will pursue that as I can. Um, and we don't have... John, who had some questions about SM BIOS information. Uh, here it is. So, and I've added Corbin's response. So that said, John was looking at retrieving information from, say, SM BIOS. And I thought, whoops, he wanted a serial number? Yes. So jumping to the very end, it's like, oh, here we have from one source of information, like, one value versus 26. Has anyone here dabbled with slamming in serial numbers with dash E or dash O and seen unexpected behavior?
because I personally had an epiphany that one could say have a Windows guest do auto unattend XML acrobatics and system configuration based on say a serial number and maybe even like a Windows key and other things that you just discreetly hand to the VM from behind the scenes. So um yeah. I have not personally put a lot of thought into this. Doesn't Windows have support for terrible things like um, looking into the UAFI uh, configuration for, uh, I, I think, what did this uh, spyware by Lenovo uh, exploit the mechanism so that you, it, which is intended to auto install drivers and so on, but they abused it to uh, have something basically inject a browser um, search bar a replacement. Oh, really? OK. Yeah, uh, something spy fish or something. Uh, but the mechanism is implemented. And if you emulate the right divider, uh, right kind of configuration, you may be able to uh, take advantage of this insanity inside of Windows that it allows us vendors to include basically drivers and other privileged uh, code in the firmware to then be loaded by the operating system and auto started on every boot if it's not already registered. Yikes. Okay. Superfish might be it. I Superfish. Found it. Yeah, that's Superfish. what's the name, I think. Ah. And that's how they reinstalled it on every Windows installation unless you caught it very early and did something to corrupt this mechanism, I think. No kidding. Uh, no jerks. Okay. Let's it go. was really a persistent rootkit uh, built into the firmware with cooperation uh, for Microsoft because they implemented the mechanism what? for hooking this into. And into what's the profession German? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it did a, a SSL a man in the middle attack to replace ads and sniff on user traffic to correct nice. the personalized data. So, and of course they did the man in the middle TLS certificate validation poorly. So you were uh, vulnerable to others uh, doing the same. And I think they also included the private key inside the code, of course, because and used a single trusted private key for the certificate. So basically okay. when you had the software, you had the private key for the the man in the middle certificate because it wasn't generated per device. Mm -hmm. So basically you could man in the middle anyone running this by extracting the private key and then running man in the middle proxy. Uh, and uh, then the malware injected into the guest in this case, which in the case of superficial, oh, I know that that's my CA. Yeah, let's Goodness. bless that content. Goodness. Okay. I don't, uh, yeah. Yuck. I don't even want to hear about that. That's awful. Thank you, Lenovo. Jeez. Okay. Um, it was almost a decade ago. Uh, so okay. uh, maybe uh, they learned to be sneakier. Okay. So, uh, Jan, I know you were working on UCL macros, and Chris didn't have a chance to drop in for the later slot. Uh, any news on this? Any, you still have an open request for macro ideas? I'm still looking for ideas because a lot of stuff would be easy to do as part of cleaning up the code, uh, simple things. Um, I found out that, yeah, there is a, a bug report. I haven't checked if anyone acted on it. Uh, you have a link to that? Uh, with lib UCL, yep. Let me check with my... Uh... Rule number one, have your links handy. And I, you probably didn't guess I'd be broad, broad citing mm -hmm. your regression request. Yeah, so there was no new release uh, since then, but uh, the author acknowledged the regression. Uh, here's the link. Thank you. And with, okay. if this is fixed, uh, which it sounds like there's a good chance you will do it um, in the next release. So let's check if there was any changes. Oh. Uh, nope. 
nothing since the last, at least not to the master branch. So uh, it hasn't been fixed yet. So the issue is open, but uh, I assume because it's really a one line change to uh, restore that feature, which got uh, patched out again as part of importing a collection of bug fixes from another uh, branch. And so um, with this, uh, I can um, just, if it works again, I can basically implement a callback function, which gets called when a variable, which is unknown to the parser, is attempted to be expanded. So basically the parser sees, oh, this is syntactically a variable reference, but I have no variable of that name when it calls your uh, callback with the current position of the parser and the file and the already passed uh, objects there. And then you can, for example, just uh, go in and uh, register the variable or manually replace it every time and it has to call out every time. So uh, the tempting way to use that is to uh, make it possible to reference the, the already existing keys in the current object. That's trivial to do so that if you are uh, and the other one would be to maybe search up the uh, parent tree in the past tree. So if you have a parent object, if you don't find it in your current object, look it up there, or maybe allow similar to how Unix handles uh, relative paths. If you start the name with dot dot slash or something, uh, you go up and if then you can navigate basically the part which is already passed. Um, I have already implemented the mechanism some in another way where you can uh, glob against, uh, you basically consider what's already passed as a file system tree with uh, the leaf nodes in the, as files and the inner arrays and objects as uh, directories where an, as the uh, an object is a directory with named entries and an array is a directory with everything but also um, as a directory, but it just happens with all um, <laughs> file names are numbers. And then you can use uh, the FreeBSD libc glob, uh, which funnily enough already has support for uh, replacing the actual file system IO with uh, function calls to your own callbacks uh, so that I can basically emulate uh, open deer, read deer, and close deer uh, to uh, instead fill out the struct deer end as required um, by glob. And then uh, we get to enjoy the fun of saying dot import and then a glob pattern. Uh, and then you can say something like dot import dot dot uh, slash defaults uh, star. Okay. And then you could have basically a node sitting somewhere in your parent object or maybe level higher still. And you could preload that as default configuration, which would be useful for things like a Beehive manager or uh, why I'm looking at it for jails. Any questions relating to that? Hmm. Moving on, uh, do we have any hard topics prior to soft topics? Did you hear back uh, about VPP? And did we make any progress or is it still just ongoing, but it takes time? The con Oh, so that came up in the context of IPv6 with uh, you and a frequent attendee of these calls, arguably a co-host. And so uh, the comment from Maximiliano Stucchi was that the VPP effort is different from, say, having, what was it, either DHCPv4 uh, client in base or having packet filter support a uh, NAT B, yes. NAT64. Um, yes, it is. Apparently the parallel cases. efforts and there's no news per se short of identifying the people who could be involved in that. Uh, I, did I drop that in the, maybe it's in the jail call. It's all a multi-dimensional beast. Um, 
do, 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 do. So no, I don't have any uh, news, and I am watching the see git for beehive and uh, for what it's worth uh, i see some movement that might be related to arm but it doesn't look like getting us things on a uh, user space good news it's just housekeeping not to change topic there uh jan any very super clear specific questions related to ipv6 and other good stuff going on um, um, I fail to see the connection between IPv6 or IPv4 and DHCP or the static auto configuration or even DHCP v6 on the one end and the layer underneath that is the Ethernet emulation. Uh, my context. So it's basically a a two different broader... layers, and I hope you are not intending to no, watch them too closely. I'm going. I'm checking features off the list of a router based on FreeBSD. So that's what. Oh, but is. that's. Uh, and you okay. brought up VPP, and I think this is where uh, the VPP stats were. Thank you for that reminder. So uh, here uh, are from his neighbor. They implement their own uh, layer three functions to do netting and so on, okay. because going through the kernel and back again would be very slow. So they have to implement that because they bypass the normal host network stack for performance reasons. And if they had to go through the kernel for nothing, that would be a problem. But they probably only implement a DHCP relay, uh, at least they used to, I think. So that basically you uh, have your DHCP server running and then the VPP acts as a relay. A request, a relay will guest request and that should hopefully work. Okay. Uh, to whom it may concern, I'll drop this in chat. That was an ongoing discussion about something code name nonsense that is not PF sense, it is not open sense, it is simply FreeBSD with a few features enabled. Anyhow, Jan, anything else related to that or any questions from the <laughs> gallery? gallery? I think I have most of what's on your wish list here, except for uh, anything front end and user friendly work. <laughs> So awesome. And that's all been parallel discussions this last four days or so. So no, don't lose any sleep over it yet. We're busy. The little gremlins are doing our thing. Uh, there's too late, I think, movement. at least for Antrenic. I, I think we've got courses at this time. Uh, there is a bunch of arm movement. So I will note that. Uh, so that said, especially Hans, who is a busy boy and not always joining us, do re reach out to Vitaly. And uh, if you don't jump in with something new, there was a very strange comment that started the week off. And we touched, we, we started the jail call with it and touched on it briefly. But there was this busy um, comment. Yes, Jan? There's one more thing. Yes, um, do you happen to know if anyone is looking into finally just basically stabilizing the uh, Beehive IPC socket interface that is feature gated behind the snapshot support to pull it out if the snapshot support uh, takes longer so that at least we have that in place so that the smaller things can take advantage of it. Um, things like uh, attaching to a system console, doing a clean, uh, shutdown, reboot, and so on. Yeah, but you can do easier things than complete state uh, serialization and desterialization for it. Well, I see. Or maybe getting us closer to uh, being able to hot plug, uh, at least replace the backing file descriptor for an existing uh, virtual device. Like, Telling it here's here's the new um, file descriptor. Use this from one from now on for your virtual and VME device. That shouldn't be, uh, be too hard because um, I think there are just two types of messages involved in doing the, the event notification via that this device has to be rescanned uh, in uh, NVMe. And for others, yeah, maybe just quickly unplug it with it as SCSI. Everything you need is there in SCSI. It's just that it's 
they are more than once over the decades. So yeah. Well, it's funny you mention that. So of course, if you use VetIO SCSI, you already can do uh, hot plugging, uh, and then only the notification is missing. So uh, there is that activity oh, from February from Vitali. Some attention to the compiling error M. La la la. Not not very on point there. Okay. Um, I do not have an answer for you on that. Okay, um, that's just uh, saving some state that was overlooked. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I don't have an awesome answer for you. Uh, but do watch those usual suspect spaces. Anything else? Do we want to talk about the bizarre ongoing FUD or has that been adequately discussed in various social media platforms? I wouldn't even call it FUD. I would call it uh, attempts at gaslighting. Uh, gaslighting, okay. Yeah, that term hasn't come up in these contexts. And because yeah. uh, until uh, at most a year ago, they came, no, there are no places in, in uh, no plans in place to ever stop drop uh, support. Uh, sorry, to ever drop um, free in as core. And then suddenly uh, they go silent and a little bit later without any notification, they have a, a their migration plan off of it by basically just abandoning it, which limits its lifetime as a binary product to the lifetime of a FreeBSD 13.x release branch. So you can look it up when the ports tree will roll over and drop that, which means yep. at that point you're not, yep. unless someone wants to maintain that the ports infrastructure changes, which will become consecutively harder and harder to do over time, and the kernel to go with it and so on. A, a big problem, which is also what slowed down the FreeBSD um, 14 release, is that you have to get them off um, the old OpenSSL. Yeah. Because uh, 13 has OpenSSL 1.1.1. something in base as uh, part of a non private ABI, and that's end of life. So, yeah, you can't indefinitely support that without effectively forking OpenSSL and maintaining your own fork. Of course, but it's yeah, it, reasonable to go on with OpenSSL three. I mean, anything else is just hmm? not not worth the effort. So yes, you have the pain once when going from FreeBSD thirteen to FreeBSD fourteen, and then we have a future proof system for the next couple of years until yeah. something upstream changes again. And it's not that it's and too hard to do, but you have to uh, forward port all of their changes. Uh, which their middleware requires to keep on functioning. Yeah, and I haven't seen any of their changes upstreamed. I mean, if they were supporting FreeBSD all these years, where are all their improvements, like the one we get from Netflix? Mm, I think they did submit a bunch of, for example, Samba bug reports with patches okay. over the years directly to the Samba project so that it's not even in the FreeBSD port, but upstream. Yeah, I definitely appreciate that. They they have a really capable resident Samba guru who is also on the forum and they, at yeah. least in that area, so, they know well what they are doing. So um, I haven't seen anyone anything in that uh, piece uh, Michael brought up again, uh, saying that FreeBSD is dying or so just that they are justifying while they why they are abandoning it as a platform and leaving their users who may have an attachment to the existing deployment of FreeBSD in more general uh, behind and marooning them uh, no. exactly like they're claiming not to. It's a mixed message, if anything. 
Yeah, hey, I'm very confused as to what they are. It's corporate PR doing. trying to do a uh, spin dart ring as damage control. Mm, at least that's my cynical take on it. That this isn't confusion or lack of understanding, but just brazenly trying to uh, bullshit your way out of a PR problem. Mm. I have one heads Maybe up. Maybe I'm too cynical, but I just noticed that BSD now, who published their new episodes on Thursdays, have now as a topic the the last uh, Truna's core release and the new uh, community fork at Z Vault already. Uh, wasn't it a bit early to put out that website <laughs> instead of just securing the domain? So did they analyze that, for lack of a better term? I, I don't know. It's just been published. They published late late on Thursdays, and I have not okay. listened to it. Okay. It's, so, But expect all sorts of, of Reddit and other platforms uh, who are BSD-related go wild because now it's on, on BSDnow.tv. Oh, but none of the domains were sold up. Okay. Oh, did I? Oh. oh. Mm. All righty, then. Yeah, you know this, Michael, don't you? It's it's been kicking around, and it yeah. anyone paying attention will bump into that. So, like, whatever transparency is our friend. Uh yeah, I don't know what to say. Uh, the GitHub organization is a bit empty. It's so far, only. <laughs> Yeah, certain persons who asked politely not to be mentioned publicly just yet are working on this, and they were just a little premature with publishing that mm. webpage. Mike, Michael, and I know who at least one one of those guys is. Not <laughs> everything on a mailing list belongs into a podcast. Don't worry about all that. So that said, apparently there's a lovely conference in Europe that has a call for participation closing, I believe, the 15th of next month, EuroBSDCon. Uh, perhaps some of you will participate. I submitted my workshop. That's a good thing about workshops. What's you the do topic? And, and you uh, Vagrant, just okay. like last year. There you go. <laughs> next well, next thing I'm planning to do is come up with a Vagrant environment for TrueNAS developers. Interesting. I have an open sense vagrant virtual machine, so now let's do a true NAS one. <laughs> Is the open sense one visible on the interwebs? Oh, of course, it's git. It's on GitHub. Could you point us to that? Vag vag vagrant dash open sense. Just a sec. Let me get the proper link. What uh, are you using to run it? Are you using their setup code? Are you just running it through a BSD install uh, auto install file or? I'm Are using, you manually driving I'm the, using their bootstrap drive. code to uh, download one of our vagrant boxes running stock free BSD and then bootstrap it into an open sense environment for local development and testing. Is open sense a package? Something I should know, but can you no. drop open no. sense on any system? Definitely no. Do? They have a Definitely bootstrap no. okay. script that you okay. can run on an already installed free BSD that will turn your free BSD into an open sense. But oh, there, is, quite there, is, there, the there is no way back. Yeah, it just clovers your existing configurations. Yep. Stuff. You, you will end up with all IP that addresses and everything. They claim ownership of that system at that point. Uh, okay. Similar to how you used to be able to create an uh, Olive uh, system uh, out of by starting with FreeBSD 4.8 or something. You said and Olive? Then starting, uh, yeah, start with an old FreeBSD 4 system and then uh, consecutively in, uh, apply uh, Juno as updates. Uh, was that Olive BSD? No, that was. Um, oh, good Lord. I haven't heard that name in a while. Uh, that oh, was. Um, goodness. Way you could get a lab system with uh, out um, following the niceties of copyright law, 
because people used to uh, run the, uh, and mirror the you know as uh, update tarboards and then the div is too large and too much so it's no longer relevant so but you used to be able to get generous running on some physical systems that way Interesting. Oh, forgot about that one yeah huh. if you needed a routing daemon these days we have adequate routing daemons for the user space part and ports so maybe you don't want to yeah run basically uh, wears <laughs> as your router <laughs> What's VirtualBox, Grandpa? <laughs> the hypervisor that works on desktop operating systems and was a lot more common than I... it is now when Vagrant was started. So, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, cool. Ah, to, ah, for those running on certain other OSs. Okay, fair enough. I'll grant you that. But they even have, have you tried it with uh, by UTM on Macintosh? That's, no. It's, you know, a... Does it work with end. QEA email on the command line? Honestly, I don't know. I, I mean, I run Vagrant. I'm perfectly fine with that. Yeah, well, I'm thinking <laughs> if of I need, hypervisor. If I, if, I, if, if I need more fancy network setup uh, and simulate an entire data center, which I to do a couple of years in the past for OpenStack, for example... I use VMware Fusion, and for everything else, it's Vagrant. That's cool. The default hypervisor for Vagrant is still VirtualBox. Ah, and, oh, is it? I didn't know that. Okay, cool. Well, there you go. That guy. Okay. Yeah. Cool. We we were we were at the data center with a professional photographer, and he said, "Now do something with servers." You know, <laughs> spontaneous, relaxed pictures. Beautiful. <laughs> oh, phone numbers. Cool. Okay, love it. Cool. Ship it. Anything else, or shall we enjoy the rest of our weeks? I have imagine.sh news, but I. I'm deep, uh, working out some bugs. I've done some massive refactoring, so I will hopefully have something next week. Uh, well, you call it or I'm going to call it. Okay. Seems okay. like we're at an end. Awesome. Have a great one, everyone. Keep your topics coming. Uh, it's yeah, all the people who had topics didn't show up, but we covered some wonderful things, and I appreciate that. And someday I will get a clock that is on my desk with time in UTC, so I don't have to look it up. Okay, okay. super, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Take care. And uh, Hans, shall I reach out to Vitaly, or would you like to on time captures? Well, if you want to reach out to him, uh, that's fine. Cool, I'll do that right after this call won't happen for me. Super. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Later. Cheers. Bye-bye.